You heard of this thing, the eight minute abs? Yeah, sure, eight minute abs. Yeah, the uh, exercise video. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, this is going to blow that right out of the water. Listen to this seven minute abs. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. <laughs> I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and upstairs, talking to mom right now, is a fantastic guest. He's the uh, uh, co-founder of this small sports team called uh, uh, Orlando Magics. Magic. Oh, <laughs> the Orlando Magic. I knew that. But, you know, he's not just behind a basketball franchise. Today, he'll share his decades of C-level executive experience and combine them with lessons from another Orlando guy, visionary, animator, and creator, Walt Disney. Help us welcome for a rousing discussion, Pat Williams. Plus, during our headline segment, health savings accounts have changed a ton during the last 12 months. Which ones are good? We'll ask the Associate Director of Multi-Asset and Alternative Strategies team at Morningstar, Leo Atchison. Later, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Julie, who's unexpectedly found herself with a few extra hundred dollars and no idea on how to invest low-level, one-off windfalls. <laughs> Don't you worry, we'll still have time for my incredible trivia. And now, speaking of magic... Two guys who think yelling 52 card pickup counts as a magic trick. Joe and oh, j j j j j I hate that every time OG does it. Every <laughs> I forgot time. all about that key. Until this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Annoying Cards All Over the Basement podcast. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. Here for a Monday and across the card table Monday, from me, fun day. it is my friend OG. Hey man, it's a Monday. It's a Monday fun day. A little early for uh, Miller Lite, but I like it. I like your style. <laughs> Hard to be drinking Miller Lite at a six a.m. <laughs> Hard to be drinking Miller Lite ever, but at especially at one o two a.m. on a. Then again, at zero dark thirty. Yes, because mm -hmm. uh, we're recording this live. Most people don't know that when they download the show, they think like. That was recorded and put yes. on the internet somewhere. That's not how it works. What, when you are download, like when you hit play, we are actually doing it right that moment. And it is exhausting redoing this three times for all three listeners. Exactly. Yes. And it's even more difficult. You're welcome, America. When we get halfway through and somebody else presses record. <laughs> like throwing our voice in two places. That's absolutely difficult. Uh, you know, it's not difficult, though getting money for your business. Historically, it has been difficult, but thanks to Cabbage for supporting Stacking Benjamins, you can get the money you need to run your small business today. Go to cabbage.com to get started. Credit line subject to review and change. Individual requests for capital are separate installment loans issued by Celtic Bank, member FDIC. I feel like I should say that faster, don't you? Like uh, credit line subject to review and change. Individual requests for capital, separate installment loans issued by Celtic Bank, member FDIC. I feel like I should do that. No? Nah, pass. Nah, we'll let it go. Steb will say thanks to HoneyBook for supporting Stacky Benjamins. You run your own business? Well, then you're used to doing it all. But if you're struggling to get through your to-do list, HoneyBook can help. Go to HoneyBook.com slash SB, and they're going to give you, listen to this because you're a stacker, 50% off your first year. You're welcome. Again, how about that? All this goodness in one place, live podcast, money for your business, taking care of the books and, and the founder of the Orlando magic upstairs talking about Pat Williams. How about that? I actually have an interesting connection to the Orlando magic. Yeah. There was a really, really, really awesome basketball player from Michigan state university. I do not remember his name because he went to Michigan state, but he is from my wife's hometown and went to high school with her before he transferred and like got really big into basketball. So her friends and her uh, know, well, I mean, he's retired now, but, uh, but have been 
you know, they've, they've got all these pictures from being like on the floor and stuff like that with when he was playing for the Orlando Magic. Well, that's good. But you know what? I know the founder. So there you go. You got me beat. Bam. Well, you're about to, too. He's coming down in a minute. But first, we got some headlines. So let's get this party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline comes to us from Market Watch. This is a difficult story written by Jacob Passy. Getting divorced costs this woman nearly a million dollars in retirement savings. How to avoid her fate. Jacob writes for Michelle Bonin Country, getting divorced wasn't just an emotional blow. It was also a significant financial setback. Bonin Country, who now works as a certified financial planner and certified divorce financial analyst, is she got in the business to learn exactly what uh, what was what, probably. Yeah. Let's see. Estimates her lack of a prenuptial agreement in the terms of her divorce settlement ultimately led to her losing out on about a million dollars in retirement savings. When she got married in 1997, she and her then husband each already owned property. They chose to live in the house that Boone and Country had bought on her own with a roughly $20,000 down payment before they were married. 15 years later, when the couple initiated divorce proceedings, that decision came back to haunt her. Buna Country's parents got divorced and her father developed health issues to support her father. Uh, she and her husband agreed to refinance the house's mortgage and give him the proceeds. See where this is going? Okay, go on. At the time, though, Boone and Country was primarily a stay-at-home mother working only part-time as a software developer. In order to qualify for the new loan, she added her husband to the house's deed so that the underwriter would consider his income. So now... Oh, Yep, she has this house, adds her husband uh, uh, to the house. House is located in New York. She'd assume the state law would protect her right to the home in the event of divorce because it was her own property. She realizes her mistake today. I should add a marital agreement that said it was my property, she said. Initially, the couple planned to go to a mediator to handle the divorce, which wouldn't have been expensive, but they bowed to pressure from family and friends and took the court route instead. Isn't that what happens? Not just family and friends, OG. A lot of the time, the lawyer would prefer to go to court because they get paid more. Well, yeah, of course. Boone and Country and her ex-husband agreed to sell the home as part of the divorce settlement with the proceeds meant to be split evenly between the two, even though she'd originally purchased the house on her own. Complicating matters. Health concerns arose for one of Buddha Country's two kids as the divorce was being finalized. In order to be closer to family for support, she decided to move to Arizona, where she now lives. She immediately agreed to give up custody of her other child to her ex-husband so she could leave New York. After she moved, Buddha Country's ex-husband changed his mind regarding selling their home, and it became difficult for her to enforce the property sale from across the country. In her divorce, she retained her individual retirement account, which contained both separate marital assets. However, the divorce settlement didn't reflect that she had kept this IRA as a concession in exchange for not receiving spousal support payments from her ex-husband and delaying child support. It allegedly incorrectly identified the account as containing only Buna Country's own assets. Between everything then, OG, it ended up costing her around $200,000, which, by the way, over the last 20 years, she says, would have grown to a million dollars. And that doesn't include the additional savings she missed out on as she went to pay back uh, all the loans and, and all the ugliness. This is an issue. The reason I brought this up is that you see this all the time. People think a divorce is going to be amicable at the beginning and it ends up nasty. Man, I can't think of three times when a divorce didn't end up being a nasty affair. Well, I'm hopeful that neither you nor I ever have to deal with that or anybody that we know. This is, you know, was this really a thing back in the mid nineties? I mean, obviously prenups and stuff like that. I get it. or have been around since the beginning of time, but I feel like it's a little bit more, maybe not accepted is the right word, but it's a little bit more top of mind. Getting a prenup right away. Yeah. So that you're going to go, this is mine. This is yours. This is ours. You know, that sort of thing. Well, and then and did I hear you say that she had to use 200000 out of her IRA? Is that what you were saying? She had to use money from her IRA. Yeah. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So that's one of those things where 
it's like when I say discretion is a better sense of valor, right? Like at some point you just have to go, listen, this is really foolish that we are spending all this money. Let's just figure it out. And the part where they say bowing to pressure is difficult, but, but I want to go back to your idea of the prenup. Even today, people go into a marriage OG thinking that, you know, a prenup means I'm thinking it's not going to work. Like I'm not giving it my entire all right. That I'm standing with, with one foot outside the huddle, so to speak, it just <laughs> get, getting ready to run at the first sign something goes wrong. Well, that's not true. I mean, that's no different than having an operating agreement for a business. I mean, I don't plan on getting hit by a bus, but if I did, we've got a plan for the businesses. I've got a plan for my family. I've got a plan for all the different things that we do. So why would you not have a plan for, you know, for your marriage as well? So I don't think it's, I don't think it's from the perspective of, (laughs) I'm not committed. It's from the perspective of making a really good, prudent decision. I mean, this doesn't apply. I mean, when I got married, I was 25. My wife was 22. We didn't have anything. Yeah, (laughs) We had less than anything, actually. We were under the water. So she could have had half of it. (laughs) It would have been great. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, you would have come out, but it does apply, especially as you know, especially when you get married later in life nowadays and that sort of thing, success already built up or inheritances or something like that. This is another reason why good estate planning matters. You know, people say, well, you know, my kids are responsible. I don't need to put money in a trust for them. But if you leave it in the trust, it's part of the trust account. And that can affect marital property and marital assets as well. So, you know, there's a lot of different angles to this, I think. When a divorce seems imminent, one of the first things to always do is to contact your uh, financial company. And I would highly recommend freezing everything because I've seen on several cases, OG, one or both partners in the marriage decides to start robbing those accounts. And uh, as soon as one person tells you that they want them frozen, are you required to do that? Or are you required to get both signatures before you do that? No, it really, uh, there's a, there's a tricky way to do this. Here's how I would do it. If I think something's amiss, then if somebody calls and says, Hey, um, wire a hundred thousand dollars to my, uh, new, I got a new account wired to my new account. It's a joint account. I'd say, okay, sure. There's some paperwork we have to do, but if I know something's a little funky, right. Then I'll call the other spouse and say, Hey, just confirming that wire transfer of a hundred thousand dollars over to Bill's account. And when the other person says, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? Well, obviously now you've got the, I have missed compares of communication. Now we're going to freeze the account but, and you guys can sort it out. But I know back when I was an advisor, there were a few times that this happened and I think we were, but I can't remember if, if both people had to, but both people can just agree to freeze the account, correct? Well, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot to know. I think there is a lot to know when it comes to divorce and and money. And in our second headline, Morningstar is out with this year's report on the state of HSAs. And with us on my dad's shortwave, OG, we've got uh, Leo Atchison, Associate Director of the Multi-Asset and Alternative Strategies team who led the research. Uh, Leo, glad you could be here with us talking HSAs again, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Well, let's talk about this. You and I talked a year ago about HSAs. I was glad to see in your report that it looks like the industry is uh, getting a little better. That's absolutely true. We've seen signs of industry improvement for sure on a number of fronts. So the industry is relatively young, so we'd expect to see continued improvement. For instance, you've seen fees come down, whether those be the maintenance fees that you pay on a monthly basis the investment fees that you pay for the privilege to invest, or actually the underlying fund fees that are available to invest in. So you've you've seen broadly all of those expenses come down. You've seen interest rates that are available on the checking account. So for individuals that are using it to spend and cover their current medical costs, you've seen some interest rates go up at a couple of providers. Overall, the investment options that investors have to select from are strong and actually improved a little bit over the last year. So for the most part, these providers have done a good job selecting investments. And they've also done a good job making their investment menus more concise. So when we looked at 
the number of investment options at each provider two years ago, which was our initial report. This is our third report now. Some of these providers had hundreds of investment options to pick from. So that's not really helping streamline the investment decision-making process. Uh, now they've really made it a lot more concise and easier to digest. The most investment options that a provider had this year was 33. So overall, that should help investors and individuals make better decisions. You go over the top 11, and I wonder how at Morningstar, I can see you guys, Leo, sitting around a big table and going, okay, we could do the top five, we could do the top 10. Like, how do you decide to do the top 11 or 11 big HSA providers? Right. So it's a pretty top-heavy industry. Of the providers that we looked at, they represent about 60% of the total market. Also, we only focused on HSA providers that are available to individuals as opposed to the ones that are only free to employers and you can access through an employer group. So these are HSAs that anyone can buy. That kind of narrows it. And just given how top heavy the space is and our familiarity with the space, it was pretty evident that there's about 10 or so that are relatively popular. Um, so we landed, we landed on 11 and yeah, we, th we think that these are some of the, the most popular and uh, the, the best HSAs available. You looked at these HSAs, Leo, two different ways. Can you explain the different ways you looked at them? Because really, this makes a big difference too, depending on how you're using the HSA. That's right. We evaluated these providers from two different perspectives. One, from a spending account perspective. That is actually how the most people use their HSA, is they put money into essentially a checking account. So it's a tax advantage. It goes into a checking account, and you use that to cover your current medical costs. So you're spending it. And then the other way that we looked at it was for individuals that want to invest it for the long term. And that actually allows you to maximize the tax benefits that are offered through HSAs because not only is your money going in tax-free, but then the investment growth is tax-free. And then when you withdraw it, it's also not taxed. And so it's, it's the most tax-favored vehicle in the entire tax code, as long as you spend it on qualified medical expenses, which you're likely to have in retirement, right? Fidelity has come out with a study that says the average couple spends almost $300,000 in aggregate in retirement on yeah, health care. Well. And so... If you you know think about what's the best way to save for those costs, it's without a question through an HSA. I've got a question about where is it going from here? So the biggest improvement, it seems to be in costs and, and making things simpler for people. I think as companies get a little bit more scale, they're more interested in providing this. But what do you guys want to see as kind of the next evolution of this? Right. While there was much improvement, which you would expect from a relatively young industry, there's uh, absolutely continued room for improvement. So for instance, we evaluated these providers from two different perspectives, from a spending side and from an investing side. And we looked at them on multiple different metrics within each of those frameworks. None of them received a positive mark across the board as both spending and investing. So right there, that, that shows that there's room for improvement. It's to put some numbers behind it. While fees have come down, they still vary wildly among the providers. Mm. For instance, the average HSA investor, if you want to buy a passive 60-40 portfolio, so completely indexed 60-40, the cheapest that you can get it for is two basis points. The most expensive you can get it for is 69 basis points. Holy cow. Right. So there's, there's a really big difference in fees that you're paying among them. So we really have identified these as some of the top providers. They have some of the most assets. So they should be the best offerings, but you still have that disparity in expenses that you're paying. And I think with communication too, I think employees or consumers don't really recognize that they have the flexibility, unlike their 401ks. I think everybody's been conditioned to say, hey, with your 401k, this is the plan. These are your options. It is what it is. But most people are, forget that while your company may provide this HSA, you're not locked into that one. That's absolutely right. If the HSA that your company is offering doesn't offer very favorable terms or investments or fees, then the best strategy would be to you know, make your contributions to your employer HSA because then you get these additional FICA tax benefits. Plus, it's, an, it's easy. It can be deducted from your payroll. But then just make periodic shifts over to uh, HSA that you would prefer. What we recommend would be Fidelity's HSA, which they essentially offer completely for free to individuals. 
That was exactly what I, where I wanted to go next, Leo. Let's dive into these companies. Was Fidelity then best overall? Fidelity is. So they entered the HSA space for individuals. They've been offering it to employers for a while now, but they open it up to individuals that aren't connected to an employer within the last year. So we added them to our valuations this year, and they came out on top uh, by a landslide, whether you're looking at it from a spending account side or from an investing account side. They're really offering it for free. They don't have fees. There's no maintenance fee. There's no investment fee. And when I say investment fee, that's literally a fee that these providers, some of them charge for the privilege to invest. I'm not talking about the underlying fund fees. So really what all you would be paying at Fidelity is the underlying fund fees if you're investing. And then on top of that, if you just want to use it as a spending account to cover your current medical costs, when you put that money into a checking account, you're getting far the highest rate then you're getting uh, interest rate than you're getting at any of the other providers. You're getting about 1.07% versus the second best provider is you get about 0.25% on a $2,000 balance. Mm -hmm. Um, That's the average balance in checking accounts. So um, really on all fronts, Fidelity just came out on top. Who else uh, overperformed when it came to the spending side for people that are going to actively use their fund, Leo? So the second best would be Lively. They also offer it essentially free. There aren't fees that you have to pay on a regular basis. Their interest rate was just a little bit lower. They're the one that is second to Fidelity, offering 25 basis points. And on top of that, the HSA Authority would be our third pick. They also don't charge fees on like a regular basis. You, have to, you do have to watch out for some hidden fees, but they're relatively avoidable. For instance, like paper statement fees. If you want those, mm-hmm. you can opt out and get electronic and avoid them. But um, that provider does have a little bit more of those those type of fees you have to be wary of. And also the interest rate is lower than what you can get at Lively and Fidelity. But still, they offer it for free, so you have a pretty good option if you're there. And then uh, on the investing side, who were uh, some of your top performers? Again, so Fidelity came out on top. <laughs> They're not charging any investment fee for the privilege to invest. And um, overall, that, that, you know, that leads to a really low price. They're the provider where you can buy a passive 60-40 portfolio. Your all-in cost is two basis points. Uh, hmm. The next best provider on that would be Bank of America, where you can get a passive 60-40 for about 30 basis points. You know, they're ahead by a landslide. They also, um, one thing that we look at is an investment threshold. So if you are thinking about your HSA as an investment vehicle, you want to invest for the long term, then you want to be able to invest as much as you can. But some of these providers require you to keep a certain amount of money in the checking account before you can invest. Uh, yeah. Like one or 2000 So it doesn't seem like a huge amount, but when you consider the average HSA investment balance is about $13,000. That's you know a pretty high percentage, and so then there's an opportunity cost to that money. So uh, Fidelity doesn't require you to keep anything in the checking account. Another thing that's interesting is what you see is a lot of the providers, so 7 of 10 require you to keep money in the checking account before you invest. And coincidentally, a lot of them happen to be banks, right? So they they, they want money in the checking Sh- account because yeah, sh- shocker there's there. interest margin on that, right? Right, right. <laughs> but yeah, Fidelity doesn't require that. And then also they they have good investment options to select from. They have a curated list where there's no transaction fees. If you, if you and they've you know pretty much a simplified an investment menu for you, and it's not only Fidelity options either. They also offer some competing firm strategies such as like J.P. Morgan, for instance. It's overall it came out on top by it, far. Yeah. Wow. Uh, last question, Leo. Did anything surprise you this year versus when we talked to you 12 months ago? I would say. I, while, while, while the industry overall did improve in certain cases, not as much as, as I was expecting. Um, so for instance, transparency was a big thing that we highlighted last year, how transparency is really poor across the industry. So actually getting this information and comparing these providers and stacking them up one versus another on all these different metrics is a, a really challenging task if you are someone that's just trying to gather this information like from websites and call centers. That was the approach that we took last year. You'd be surprised at how hard it is to get a simple thing such as like, what is the fee to <laughs> use this HSA? Some of, some of them will tell you once you sign up, then we'll tell you. 
Other times you call a call center, it's, it's nowhere on the website. You call a call center and you can't get a straight answer from someone at the call center about it and they don't know. So, and overall, there's not like a standard disclosure document for these HSAs like there is for other types of vehicles, like for instance, 529 plans. They have a program description where you can find all the information you need for HSAs. That's not the case. Um, so we, we highlighted that there was relatively poor transparency in the space and we showed, um, you know, different categories like whether you want to find the maintenance fee, the investment fee, the investment lineup, the interest rate, um, you know, certain things like that. We, we looked for all of these things at each provider website. It was only five of them that actually provided all of that information. Holy, Other ones oh. were missing – only five. One of them, only five of eleven. Other ones were missing at least one. Some were missing up to five out of the seven different categories of, of information we were looking at. Well, hopefully, so, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully that, that if there was some improvement. You know, some provider that we highlighted last year um, that didn't have some of that transparent information. They did make changes, but I. I was hoping to see more on that, but uh, yeah, there's still a way to go overall for the industry. Well, hopefully, Leo, when we talk to you next year, we'll continue to see. Maybe it'll be up to seven that you can get the answers from. <laughs> Easy. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Better, better you and your team. And by the way, we will link to a uh, story at Morningstar.com, which goes over this uh, on our show notes page at StackyBenjamins.com. Leo Atchison. Great talking to you again. Thanks for spending some time with us talking about HSAs. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Big thanks to Leo for calling in Dad Shortwave. You know, oh, gee, the difference between a good HSA and a bad HSA can make all the difference in the world. And I think people think, oh, I got an HSA. Mm, still a little bit more battle to do. There's a long ways to go on HSAs. They're getting better every single year, like we talked about, but there's a lot to go yet. Before we get to our Takeaway, I'd like to talk about one big takeaway that anybody who's starting a business has, which is that managing inventory, covering payroll and doing a hundred other things before lunch, it's just an average day when you own a small business. Your time's valuable and getting the money you need shouldn't take up all that time. And that's why Cabbage has created a simple, modern way for businesses to access up to $250,000 of credit. If you've ever tried to go to a bank for credit when you own a small business, getting that is uh, is next to impossible. Cabbage's application process is online, takes just minutes to complete instead of the mounds and mounds of paperwork you might have at a bank. If your business qualifies, you can access the amount you need right away and withdraw more funds whenever you need extra capital. Cabbage has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and has provided over 200,000 small businesses with access to funding. You always wonder how many people actually look at the Better Business Bureau ratings. We were talking about that the other day. That You, know, you always hear about Better Business Bureau, and man, there were all kinds of complaints, but when's the last time you went to the Better Business Bureau site, OG, to check it out and see if... See if a company was really what they said they were. It's been kind of a while, actually. Yeah. And it, should. it used to be a big thing. Yeah. And, and it shouldn't be. I think it's so frustrating when I've met with people who have great ideas and they have, they're not struggling at all and a bank won't give them any money and they want to tie every single asset that a person has to them getting money. It is super duper discouraging to see that when you know that if you have just this little push, you might be over the top to uh, get the business where you need it to be. Get the money you, you need to run your small business today. Head to cabbage.com to get started. That's K A B B A G E.com. Credit line subject to review and change. Individual request for capital, separate installment loans issued by Celtic Bank, member FDIC. I did it anyway. Couldn't help it. So I think our takeaways here number one, if you're getting married and you have assets, don't look past, do not look past that prenuptial agreement. I think that's number one, OG. Number two there, when a divorce is in the works, I think you got to look at the big picture. The, you know, the big picture is you want to start your life on your own and look at this horror story with all these attorney fees and these court costs because they, quote, bowed to pressure. I don't think you want to do that. And third, HSAs, not all created equal. So do some homework, maybe head and take a look at Leo and his team's report over at Morningstar. All 
I'm so excited about this guest, Pat Williams. He's a basketball Hall of Famer. He's the co-founder of the NBA's Orlando Magic, and he's the former general manager of the Philadelphia 76ers. He's also, of course, you know him as one of America's top motivational and inspirational corporate speakers. He's addressed employees from many Fortune 500 companies. He's the author of over 100 books. His most recent, before this one, was called Character Carved in Stone, Leadership Secrets of the United States Military Academy at West Point. Of course, he's a guy, though, being in Orlando, who has a fascination with somebody I've always had a fascination with, a guy named Walt Disney. We're going to talk to him about his latest, latest book, which tackles leadership lessons we can learn from Walt. But you know what, OG? I don't think we're just going to learn leadership lessons from Walt. There's a lot of leadership we can learn from Pat Williams. Let's say a big hello to Pat Williams. And on my dad's shortwave, it's our new friend, Mr. Pat Williams. How are you, Pat? Joe, I'm well. I'm glad to hook up with you, and thanks for uh, seeking me out here. I'm so glad that you could join us. You talk in your book about finding your dreaming tree, and that's one of the takeaways from the first chapter of your book. And we'll talk maybe a little bit about a dreaming tree later on, but you've created so many things during your career, Pat. What has your personal dreaming tree been? I think they come kind of in waves. You know, my initial dreaming tree was to be a major league ball player. That started when I was seven years old. And then to become a um, major league sports executive. That happened in basketball with the Chicago Bulls when I was 29 years old. Uh, Then the next one came many years later in Philadelphia to win an NBA title. We won that one in 1983, and then a little bit after that, uh, start up your own team, an expansion team that would have your stamp on it. And that happened here in Orlando in 1986 and 87. I've always thought that Orlando could be a good Major League Baseball city, and uh, we've tried that way back, and uh, that's still kind of stuck in the back of my brain, that uh, that's something... To pursue. I think that's kind of a quick look at the uh, question you just proposed. Yeah. And I'm wondering, I'm thinking about back there, 1986, 87, Pat, and you're on your way to Orlando. And obviously, you know, you're going into Walt's backyard, right? Were you a fan of Walt Disney before then? Or did you become a fan as you were moving down there and uh, setting up the Orlando magic? Well, uh, like so many in the world, I grew up exposed to everything Disney, you know, as a little boy. Uh, And then I remember that when he came on television at night, Sunday nights, you know, so there was definitely a leaning that way. Uh, However, uh, it didn't really ignite until I got down here in the summer of 1986 in this uh, NBA pursuit to bring an NBA team here to Orlando. But I got Disneyized. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, it happens. And, and I, got, I got infected. And I became particularly intrigued with Walt Disney himself. And I began to run into senior Disney executives who had worked with Walt back in California. And I always was picking their brains. So that infection uh, has continued to grow over the years. Uh, this is the third book I've written about Walt Disney, the one that's just out now. And so I'm a full-fledged Disney-holic. I'm a Disney fan, too. And people, I think, think I'm a fan of the theme parks or the rides or, or Mickey Mouse. And I like all that stuff. Don't get me wrong. The thing that inspires me about Disney right now is when you go to Orlando and you're at the Magic Kingdom and you see these people that work there that you know are not the best paid people in the industry. They're not bringing home a huge wave. And yet they all have that pixie dust thing, right? They're all excited about the customer and about thrilling other people and this life of service. That's what inspired me. Was that what initially what inspired you or was it something different? Well, it all goes back to Walt Disney, Joe. Walt, uh, who's been gone from this earth over 50 years now, but he still inspires people. Uh, Lots of us, including those people who work for Disney World or Disneyland or wherever. Uh, They all have caught on what Walt wanted. 
And that is, he wanted a place where people could come and have the entertainment experience of a lifetime, where they would be treated as guests, uh, where they would be treated and, and their the service would be almost indescribable. These people that you just mentioned, uh, they never knew Walt, but they, they act like they do. And, and Walt's philosophy still permeates every part of Disney today. It truly does. And I'm just thinking, you do such a great job, by the way, in Lead Like Wall of going through his early life. And I think about how many people he inspires, Pat, and yet you write that like his uncle told him, he needed to go get a real job. Well, that's true. Walt had a lot of critics. He had a lot and many naysayers who told him things that he was gonna, wanted to do were just crazy and would never work. But Walt loved those naysayers uh, because when they hit, he knew it was time to move and do the stuff he wanted to do when he had enough people saying no. Uh, That's what really drove him. But Walt was, above all, he was a visionary. We write about that. Uh, He saw the future before it got here. He saw farther down the road than the rest of us. Uh, He saw in uh, final form, and then he worked backwards putting the pieces in place to turn that vision into reality. And uh, that was part of his uniqueness, this, this visionary approach to life that he had. Is there a system or is there a technique, Pat, that you use in all of your speaking and your writing to do that, to be closer to Disney and being able to do that? Well, I've studied Walt from many different angles uh, and written about him from many different angles. Uh, But this one, I wanted to really look at Walt as a leader. What was it about this man and his leadership strengths that allowed this company to continue to flourish 50 years or so after he's gone? What he did as a leader must have been spectacular for this company to be so solid and keep growing like it is now. And that's what we wanted to dive into with this book. And in the book, we lay out after much research, the seven leadership qualities that Walt had that allowed his dreams and all that he did to become reality. I've already shared the first one with you a minute ago. The leadership principle number one was called vision. Walt was a visionary, and we just talked about it, but but great leaders are visionaries. That's a fundamental piece of their leadership strength, the ability to see down the road Uh, to see before others and to see in a wider scope than others. Vision to me always is the earmark of great leaders. We, we obviously won't have time to get into all seven, but I do want to dive into that first one and maybe a little bit about the second one about being a good communicator. But in the first piece there, you talk about find your obsession. And then number two, in this you alluded to earlier, listen to sound advice by ignoring the naysayers. I'm, I'm sure, Pat, in your career, you've had plenty of naysayers, but you, you also know, like I do, that there's times when the naysayers are right. How do you know when to listen to the naysayer and when to do like Walt did and say, nope, I know this is the way we need to go? Well, you definitely need to have wise counselors around you. Uh, you definitely need good advisors, people who... Um know the lay of the land and you want to listen to them and you may have to modify uh, some of your dreams, some of your visions. That's okay. But you do not want to be surrounded with a bunch of doomsday people who are negative on everything, who are always trying to destroy your dreams and belittle you. Oh, you don't want them in your life. Walt called them well poisoners. (laughs) And he was adamant about uh, getting those well poisoners out of your life. What Walt wanted around you, and this was the term he used, he called them life enhancers. Uh, you want you want as many life enhancers in your life as you can get. People that you work with, the person you're married to, uh, your friends, life enhancers, people who are building you up and rooting for you and encouraging you and cheering you on. Walt had plenty of them. But he also had some doomsday people. But uh, you mentioned communication, and I think it's important, Joe, uh, to say this. 
great to have visions and, and, and great leaders are visionaries. However, if you cannot, as a leader, communicate your vision effectively, here's what's going to happen to your vision. Nothing. Nada. Nicked. Not one thing is going to happen to your vision. And Walt was a marvelous communicator in front of his people. He could, he could take uh, an idea he had for a movie or a show, act the whole thing out in detail, act out every part, communicating to his organization, to his staff, how we would like to go about doing this. And his staff would become so infected and so excited, so fired up just from Walt presenting his ideas and communicating with him. It was, a, it was phenomenal, the strength that he had. Now, everybody cannot be a great world-class communicator like Walt, but we can all be pretty good at it. Some of us really good. If we just focus on it, meaning you've got to believe it's important to talk to your people and you've got to talk to them in a way that they understand. And you've got to be a communicator of optimism and hope. You've got to communicate motivation and inspiration. And above all, Joe, you've got to really work at your public speaking skills. You've got to really work at it. I don't think any of us are really natural at that, but, but we sure have to work at it because in so many cases, leaders are up in front of their people and have to deliver uh, you know, important news or important messages. And it's so important to really become proficient as we can as a, as a speaker, as a communicator in front of other people. Few things have been as important in my career as Toastmasters. I mean, it, you know, looking in hindsight, mm -hmm. do you think to some degree we all need to be a little bit of a salesperson, Pat? Oh, absolutely. You know, great leaders are always selling. I don't care. You know, if you're a, let's say you're a coach, you've got to sell your, your game plan to your athletes. And then you've got to go sell to your bosses. You've got to sell them on what you're trying to do. And every time you're talking to the media, you're selling them so that they can in turn go and sell your fans. I'm just using that sports analogy. We're always selling. You know, when you study the president of the United States, uh, whoever it was from George Washington on down, uh, they were always from that position selling their ideas and selling their concept and selling the public on why. They should vote for me. Nonstop salesmen. That's what great leaders are. I love uh, everything from the beginning, just telling uh, Walt's story. When you mentioned him being a storyteller in front of people, I love your story about uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, about how he told everybody he wanted to tell them a story. They all walked into this dark room and he proceeds to do it himself, tell the entire story himself to his team. And they were so motivated, Pat, that they went and, and I think your quote was they used that for like the next three weeks as they were trying to get into the story. They went back to his kind of visualization and how he did it to propel them to what ended up being you know, one of the first great animated movies of all time. Yeah, and that's how the movie really turned out, exactly as Walt had presented it to him in that dark room. Right. They knew uh, how to go about it based on Walt's communication um, that was so effective. And, and by the way, Joe, the best communicators are great storytellers. Whether it was Abraham Lincoln in his yards, whether it was Jesus in his parables, uh, whether it was uh, John F. Kennedy in his quips, uh, whether it was um, Ronald Reagan, the devices he used to be the great communicator, we are hardwired. All of us are hardwired to retain stories. We love them. We can't get enough of them. Whether we're, we're a three-year-old kid at bedtime. <laughs> or whether you're sitting at a convention and the speaker is up there beguiling you with one story after the other. Uh, we love stories. So I, I tell speakers, I tell leaders across the board, save your stories, save them, write them down. Don't trust your memory because uh, we all, all absolutely are, are just enhanced, charmed by great stories. 
I totally agree. And that's what I love about podcasting is being able to hear well today, Pat, your story, a little bit of it, Walt Disney's story and many others. The book is called Lead Like Walt, Discover Walt Disney's Magical Approach to Building Successful Organizations. I would even say if even if you don't have an organization, families and well, family is an organization. Just I think it was uh, such a fun, informative read. W- where do we get it? Wherever books are sold, Pat? Yes, go up to Amazon. Yeah. A uh, great way to order books. It'll be delivered real right to your house. Barnes & Noble's uh, got the book. It's uh, in the business slash leadership section of Barnes & Noble's. Uh, books a Million has it. I think people will enjoy the book. Lead Like Walt. The design of the book is simply this. After you read it, uh, we want people to go out and be better leaders in the home in their community, in their businesses, uh, because everything rises and falls on leadership. It always has, it always will, and there's so much to learn from Walt Disney about being a great leader. Well, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you two other quick questions before we say goodbye. One is, you had a book that I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was out this spring about the 12 core virtues of West Point that build leaders. What carryover did you find, Pat, between these two books, looking at West Point leadership and Walt leadership? Well, the book that came out in the spring was called Character Carved in Stone, and it was about the 12 benches at a little park up at West Point called Trophy Point, and there was a different word carved into the end of each of those benches, and we did a chapter on each one of those words and used West Point graduates to tell the story of that particular word. What I learned was that all great leaders, no matter what field they are in, whether it's sports, entertainment, whether it's the military, whether it's government, business, it all comes down to what I'm going to share with you right now, Joe. Seven things one must do to be a leader right and true. Have vision that is strong and clear. Communicate so they can hear have people skills based in love and character that's far above the competence to solve and teach and boldness that has fearless reach a serving heart that stands close by to help assist and edify that's leadership in a nutshell powerful stuff last question i promise you have been around a lot of great leaders in the nba best coach that you have had the pleasure of uh, working with? Well, that's a, each of the coaches that I've worked with had different qualities. Uh, the first one was Dr. Jack Ramsey, who was a very, very, he was a brilliant man. Uh, saw the game, you know, through his eyes as a, as an educator. Dick Mata, fiery, intense, Cotton Fitzsimmons. In Atlanta, yeah, much the same way. Little guy, peppery, fiery. Uh, Gene Shu, an old pro, been around the game forever in Philadelphia. We had Gene, and uh, just a just an old vet. Billy Cunningham, one of the most underrated coaches, by the way, in the, in the history of the NBA. Uh, Billy uh, kind of learned on the fly. He was not coached before. But Billy turned out to be a marvelous head coach. Chuck Daly, um, Hall of Famer. Love Chuck Daly. He, he may have been uh, the, the most shrewd, insightful coach I've ever been around. We had Matt Gukas here in uh, Orlando. Good, solid pro. And we had a young Doc Rivers. Oh, yeah, right. In, or- in that's Orlando. Right, that's right, who you just did. started his coaching career here. Great people skills. Great communicator, wonderful, spirited guy. Love Doc Rivers. Uh, Those are just a few that come to mind. That's great. I won't take you up any more time. Thank you for spending a few minutes with us talking about Walt Disney and talking about leadership, Pat. I really appreciate it. Great to talk to you. Hey, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And just sit back because it's time for the highlight of the show. Yeah, that's right. My trivia. Why is it that when uh, Pat Williams talks about Disney World, I think about rides, think about fun, think about uh, desserts. (laughs) While everyone has their favorite, 
ice cream or apple pie or hold me back on Joe's mom's peach cobbler, there's one dessert that stands far and above everything else when you're in Michigan. Any guesses? It's fudge! Now, you may think you know fudge, but one very special Michigan island has built an entire industry around all their amazing fudge. So here's today's question. What's the name of this island that's Michigan's fudge utopia? I'll have your answer right after this. I remember when I first thought about starting my first business, my brother and I were hoping to start a disc jockey business and we were working out in the cornfields and talking about it all day long. But the one thing we didn't talk about was drafting proposals, looking at contracts, tracking down payments. None of that was part of our vision of glory playing records at the high school dance. And if that wasn't part of your vision either, well, then you need HoneyBook. HoneyBook is an online business management tool that organizes your client communications, bookings, contracts, and invoices, puts them all in one place. It makes it simple to run your business better. Professional templates, e-signatures, and built-in automation keep everything on track and makes you look good with your clients. They can even consolidate services that you already use. Like QuickBooks that we use, Google Suite, we use that too, Excel, uh, check, and uh, MailChimp or Gmail. It's the number one choice for client business management for freelancers and business owners so you can save time and do more of what you love with HoneyBook. It is incredible how much time we've saved not chasing after all of the little things. And by staying organized, I can put business management into a little box that we work on on Mondays. Take care of it all on Monday. Worry about making good shows the rest of the week. Right now, HoneyBook is offering stackers 50% off when you visit HoneyBook.com slash SB. Payments flexible. And uh, the stacker promotion applies whether you're going to pay monthly or annually. So go to HoneyBook.com slash SB for 50% off your first year. That's HoneyBook.com slash SB. Welcome back, dessert lovers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and this is my trivia segment. We're talking desserts here, and just to clarify for all my fans, I try not to eat too many desserts myself. I mean, it's not easy to keep this V-like swimmer's build that I've got going here. It's not that I don't like them, but once I start, (laughs) let's just say the words Doug and fried Oreos equal more time at the gym. But before the break, I asked you this question. What is the name of Michigan's island that is world famous for its fudge making? The answer, well, if you said the island that normally doesn't allow cars, yeah, you're right. If you said the island between the two peninsulas, You'd be correct, and props to you for the geography knowledge. Uh, If you said the island where they made the movie Somewhere in Time, you'd be correct, and also someone who loves chick flicks. Oh, and if you said, uh, you know, I'll just get to it. What's that island called? Mackinac Island. Well, that's the way it's spelled. The locals pronounce it Mackinac Island, but they just haven't figured out how to spell it right. Anyway, I can already hear the cries of, Doug! Just because you live in Michigan doesn't mean it's the world's best fudge. (laughs) To which I'd reply, person who interjected into my awesome trivia segment without permission, don't just take my word for it. Uh, In the history and recipe book, Oh Fudge, a celebration of America's favorite candy. Yeah, that's a real book. Notable author Lee Edwards Benning calls Mackinac Island not only, and I'm quoting here, the fudge capital of the United States, but also, and again, I quote, the fudge capital of the world. Uh, Insert mic drop here, but Joe won't let me do that because it says we don't have budget for any more microphones. Apparently, I've broken enough of them. See ya! Big thanks to Pat Williams. It's interesting, OG. It's not just leadership lessons from Walt Disney or Pat Williams. They say that if you want to know about the future, study history, right? And study some of the greatest people in history. And if you want to build an empire, 
nobody better to study than people that have already been there. They've already got the recipe, right? Already have the how to make the best chocolate cake in the world. Just copy what they're doing. I got to tell you, when I was younger, I tried to stay. Back when I was younger. Back in the day, I thought that it was more fun building the wheel myself, like learning. I always thought, nope, I'm going to learn all these lessons. And then I realized you, you could just skip ahead and learn the lessons that are really relevant if you mm -hmm. get on the back of somebody who's been there before. Finding a mentor and reading about people that have done it before, big, big win. Let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. You know what those two things are, OG? I'm going to say pumpkin pie for no other reason than I was thinking about it. And um, the perfect accompaniment to pumpkin pie, Cool Whip. Well, you'll never believe this, but it's your loved ones and your time. Oh, or that. But if it's your loved ones, your time, pumpkin pie and Cool Whip, I think those are a great four this time of year, especially. That's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now and you will get a free quote. We're going to throw out the Haven Lifeline to Julie. Say hi, Julie. Hey, Joe. OG. My name's Julie. I was just upstairs baking cookies with mom and I figured while I was already here, I'd come down to the basement and ask a quick question. I recently traded Doug a coupon for some free dinners at the Sizzler for a few hundred bucks. And now I'm wondering what I should do with it. I've got a fully funded emergency fund and I'm debt free with no real savings goals on the horizon. So I thought it might be fun to put the money into the market, but I'm not sure where to go from here. What are some sources you'd suggest I check out to find some low cost of entry mutual funds? I was looking at Morningstar, but... But then I realized once I got there, I didn't actually know what to search for. Do you have any tips you could give me about the right places to look when investing small, non-recurring windfalls? Oh, what? Oh, the, the cookies need frosting? Well, it seems like I uh, need to hop upstairs and finish helping with those cookies. But, uh, you know, feel free to answer my question anyways. I, I can't learn today, but maybe you could teach each other. It's so awesome. So awesome. The cookies do need frosting. People are uh, bringing the A game lately. It is It is getting just down and dirty. And uh, mom is uh, handing out some great stuff for the winners of our weekly contest, by the way. I think it's going to be hard to beat Wednesday and Friday, people. So let's tackle that. You got this small amount of money. You don't want to put it in your emergency fund because there's enough money there. Where do you go? I like any number of places. I would, with the new advent of commission free trading, not that that was a new thing, but at some of the bigger places, why not just uh, dump it into a ETF or something? It's not going to cost anything. It doesn't have to be recurring. You don't have to worry about mutual fund minimums. Maybe something like ultra aggressive, like a 3X bear fund <laughs> <laughs> that, re that resets daily. Daily reset, obviously. <laughs> the see, only kind. See how fast you can lose your money, Julie. I would not do that. What about like just blowing the money? I mean, if you don't have any savings or investing goals and you get everything paid off and don't own any money and build up your cash reserve. And I think that's the thing that most people don't consider as a real option. And I know you observe this. I, I certainly do. Spenders don't turn into savers and savers don't turn into spenders. You know, and so if you're kind of predisposed to always saving money, I think it's really important to recognize that it's okay to spend it sometimes. You know, it's okay to take your family out for dinner and pay for it, or it's okay to donate a little bit more to a charity that means something to you or whatever. We had a topic that at the time I think a lot of people thought was a very light topic uh, that we covered. Our friend uh, Karen Cordaway wrote a book that she talked about with us this spring, if you remember, OG, about bucket lists. You know, and about the things that, that you really want to do. And I think a lot of people listening to the show probably rolled their eyes and went, yeah, yeah, this is a money management show, not about, but, but it really is about what you want to do and pulling out that bucket list. If you don't have any real savings goals and pull out that bucket list and see if you can knock one off, I think it's a great thing to do. Yeah. Again, I think if you're on track for your financial goals, there's nothing wrong with spending money. 
especially if you do so in a meaningful way that for you is providing utility or for somebody else, you know, if it's a charity thing or whatever. So I kind of would go one or the two extremes. I would either just dump it in an ETF. I would not use a 3X bear ETF, but something aggressive, you know. Yeah. Um, or, you know, a single position, like a global equity fund that owns one of every stock in the entire world and you just call it a day. Um, or I would actually think about consuming that extra money, you know, and saying, well, like, how could I, how could I do something with this that would be fun or exciting or teach me a new skill or, you know, whatever. Yeah. That's another good idea. Sign up for classes, invest it in yourself. As we speak, Cheryl is at acting classes. You know why? Because she has to be better at pretending that she likes you. Did I just, you, you didn't, you didn't actually think that I could come up with that that fast. Did you? You're like, the, I, as soon as you started saying it, I knew what the answer was. You got halfway through saying that. And I went, I just flip and serve that up. I just serve that up. Cause she can't take your crap anymore. <laughs> she has to put on a happy face for the next 50 years. And she's trying to. <laughs> Hello husband. How are you? I'm so happy. Can you see the smile on my face? And the daytime Emmy goes to Cheryl for her acting like loving devoted spouse. Uh, But really, why is she doing it? Well, for fun, because it's something that she always wanted to do. Has nothing to do with anything, just something that she wanted to do. It's uh, quality of life. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, Julie, and my thought, if you're going to invest it, I like what OG said, pick something that you're going to be interested in. For me, I have a few individual stocks and I just invest that money in things that I really am fascinated by. So I have some money in a water ETF. I have another one in Southeast Asia because I think that Southeast Asia is a great. Yeah, we know you went there. Uh, it's, it's a great, a, big vacation. It was ag- awesome. Aggressive place it. to, to invest money. Believe it or not. I own a little, got another one in Bavaria. I own and another one in Canadian Rockies. I do not, but I do have some Disney stock. Uh, Actually, which, I have a lot of Disney, stock. which I know I like people Disney. would find hard to believe. And I use that not so much just as an investment, but to invest in things that I like. And I, and I, yeah. th- that I think a lot about. So there's always that. So if you do this, Begin with the end in mind. We've never said that before. And then walk backwards. You have to say TM. TM, right. Right. Then go into, if it, whether it's Schwab, Ameritrade, wherever you make your trades, and write down, you know, put in Southeast Asia or put in um, uh, water or whatever it might be. Then you'll find a lot of different things. And then you go to Morningstar. Once you know th- what the investment is, then you go to Morningstar and you see if it's actually worthwhile to invest your money in or not. Thanks for that question, Julie. I don't think we gave her the answer she expected. By the way, she didn't have the question we expected. Ask the way we, she asked that question in a phenomenal way. Nice, nice job. If you would like to step up and uh, see if you can bring your A game to the basement, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And uh, you too could not only Get a piece of swag, the greatest money show on earth t-shirt, one of my favorite Stacky Benjamins t-shirts that Mr. Brad Lark makes for us. But also, you could be in the running for mom's big gift to the winner every week. That's going to do it for today. Uh, By the way, we've had quite a few reviews of the show lately, and I have to say a big thanks to those people. And I know I don't hit every single review, but thanks to everybody who's who's done that, because I know that... um, That's some time you could be spending doing something else. So to spend it showing other people what you think of the Stacky Benjamin show, we're very honored that you spend that time. But here's a review that mom has on the fridge, OG. This one is from Nate Dog, 1989. He says, meh, meh. I mean, what do you expect? Five stars. Joel and OGG do a pretty decent job of teaching me basically nothing Besides what not to do with my finances, if it wasn't for Doug, this would be, well, nothing more than a total sleeper. I figure after I've listened over the past 18 months, I'm going to start out on my own, invest all my money into a single stock. Emergency fund? What am I scared of? Do I need one? You want me to index what? I've got my appointment set up with my non-fiduciary financial advisor for a small fee of 2.8% tomorrow. They'll for sure set me in the right direction. All kidding aside... 
Love the awesome segues. Love the friendly banner and love the fact that we stay with current headlines and I can take something away from each episode. Well played, Joel. <laughs> well played. Back to nice. you, Nate Dog. Should I call him Nate Dog with an L in there? Mom is bragging about you, Nate, uh, to everybody in the Bridge Club. And finally, if you're looking for good financial help in your corner, OG's team is waiting for your call. How about that? Are you sitting down? Head <laughs> to stack. Not only we, we should totally do like a, a sleazy version. Like uh, not only is a world famous OG waiting for your call, but we'll put you into. You get a free set of steak knives. Your name will go into a, in, into a raffle for Michael Bolton tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. We won't do that. OG and his team standing by head to stacky com forward slash OG. And uh, you will reach them and their calendar to see if you can do better with your money in uh, 2020. That's going to do it for today. On behalf of OG. That's me. I will say goodbye. Doug, you've got, it from, you've got it from here. Happy trails. Doug, what should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? Well, first, take some lessons from our guest, Pat Williams. Know your leadership strengths and take time to evaluate and improve your weaknesses. By learning to communicate and form a shared vision, you can become a great leader like Walt Disney. More importantly, by implementing a few leadership skills, you can accelerate the path to achieving your dreams. Second, take some advice from Leo Acheson from Morningstar. All HSAs aren't created equal, and by taking the time to do just a smidge of research, love that word smidge, you can find a great one. But the big takeaway, don't leave Joe's mom's kitchen a mess when you're recreating her peach cobbler. Sure, I used her good pans, half her bowls, and left peach cores laying around, but does that mean she has to confiscate everything I made? I should get some too. I'm the artiste here, lady. Special thanks to Pat Williams. You can find Pat's new book, Lead Like Walt, wherever books are sold or through our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I really thought doing these credits completely naked would have been a lot more fun than it actually was. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Does anybody else spend hours wondering what Kenny Loggins is doing on any given Tuesday morning? Oh, no, that's just me. As we record this, I leave for Boston tomorrow. Boston. 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 It's B-A-H-S-T-N. Did I tell you when we went to Maine, I didn't hear anybody that had the, that had the, phen- I love accents. I love the Northeast so Texas. The, the mark, like on a, yes. Like yeah. in a yes. Like I, different language where it's like tells you what the emphasis is. I'm a big fan of those. Yes, the accent symbols. Uh, 
the Northeast Texas accent where I used to live when I was at the Citadel in Charleston, uh, just that really soft Southern draw along the coast. And then, you know, Maine, get the Northeast. Of course, Michigan, what's funny is, is that I always thought oh, there's no real Michigan accent. And then you, then you come back after not living here for a while and you're like, man, y'all talk kind of funny up here in the yeah. North. <laughs> Holy cow. You betcha we do. Okay, dear. Really fast too, right? But I think, yes. That. People up in Michigan, I've noticed, coming back, you're traveling to Boston this weekend. I'm traveling up to Michigan this week. <laughs> like, so, to take a breath. It's okay. Please slow down. This is what, just explain it to me really slowly. <laughs> How much are the cheeseburgers again? It's going to be all right. But we went to Maine. I didn't hear anybody that had the mm. Northeast accent. And it was funny because we we walked into the shop and this woman very 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 strong northeast accent and Cheryl as she's buying this book that we we got she goes you know what's funny is that my husband was just complaining that he didn't hear anybody with the new england accent and the and the woman was not like why you would tell somebody that number 1 cuz everybody i think feels self conscious about their accent you know and it was funny because she was just sharing, no judgment, but the woman was having none of it. She's just like, yeah, go away. Uh, <laughs> and I can't do Here's some of this Northeast attitude. Yes. Get out of my store. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Accent one, attitude two. But there was a fantastic children's book that we saw about a kid from Maine going to a baseball game. And it's like this big giant baby. And they go to a baseball game. While they're there, the kids saying stuff like "Ma, he hit a homa," like and it's <laughs> and it's H O M A, nice and all kinds of just fun northeastern stuff. So that's going to be a good time. I love Boston. I can't wait Some to good eat. seafood up there. I um, I don't know that I've been to Boston. It's on my list. And and donuts. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, I do feel bad that you will not be at the meetup. Tomorrow, which, by the way, is people are listening to this was thanks last, for the invite, like always, which was last Thursday. I was alerted on Instagram today about we were having a meetup tomorrow, and I was not invited. Well, but, uh, I got invited to speak at a conference. I don't need to be invited to speak. You can just, I mean, I have the Stacking Benjamins corporate card. It's right here. What you can just be like, hey, dude, I'm gonna be in Boston. You should come. Why don't we well, well, jump on a plane? Just jump or fly on a plane. myself. You even. you can do it. It's tomorrow at uh, six thirty. Tavern at the end of the world. Okay. Well, AKA turns, last week for everybody. Turns listening out to this. I'm booked. Well, there you go. There you. But go. I wasn't booked like you know a month ago maybe. We have some things in the works that we might be hitting some towns. We we actually made in our business plan this year the fact that we were going to hit several towns. Mm -hmm. And we got two. <laughs> we did. We hit San Francisco and Seattle. Yep. And that was it. And cut. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, had big plans. Next year, though, I think we we air stacking Benjamins is going to take off. Well, have the corporate charter, the ability to kind of bounce around a little bit more. We're working with a potential sponsor or two on uh, something fun. So we'll see if we can get that done. Maybe. What do you think? Uh, you think Cheryl's going to let you jump in the plane? Go flying with the old G? She'll be concerned that the whole show might go down at once. <laughs> what would the world do if the whole Stacky Benjamin show <laughs> didn't exist? Doug's like, I got it from here, guys. <laughs> it would be scary. It would be, be wild. Well, you know, I've ridden in the Cirrus before. With my yep. friend Todd. That's right. That's right. And uh, he's, he's a little bit more of an accomplished pilot than me. She appreciates the parachute. Yep. And she also would appreciate your attention to detail, which I know you pretend not to have and you very much have. So uh, there's a time and a place for it. Yeah. Flying an airplane is one particular time to have high attention to detail. <laughs> very, very high. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Yeah. I think she'd, I, I, I think that'd be fine. And, well, mama don't know, don't hurt her. Am I right? <laughs> See, now that scares me right there. If I ever say, hey, hold my beer, I got to land. <laughs> Probably not good. <laughs> Might not. Actually, I've been, I've had too many beers. You got it from here. Take Your it from controls. me. It's, it's super. Oh, you've done Flight Simulator? You're good. It's just like that. You're good. 
It's just like that. I'm doing some simulator training for my uh, instrument license, which there's two different, you have to have two different kinds to be able to be flying in all conditions. You have to have a license to operate your instrument? No? I think... uh, It's different. It's a different thing. To operate by instruments. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so I'm doing some in an actual simulator, like a real full motion simulator. And it's so different than actually flying an airplane. So people who say, I used to fly flight simulator at Microsoft, so I know how to do it. Okay. Why are you like giving me the glare? Well, I'm, not. I'm just saying I'm doing it back to back. Like I'm actually flying and then I go do the simulator thing and uh, the simulator's worse. I like doing the simulator. You could let me down gently. Go, you know, it's it, it's a nice lead in, but you're like, whatever. That's not the same. I was all high and mighty the other day. Like, yeah, check this out. I know how to do all this. And it's usually pretty easy. Like you just got to kind of get used to the cadence, you know, the communication. Part of it is knowing what to expect that they're going to say. You know, they say like, you're climb talking about to like, 7,000. Like the and tower, like, what the tower is telling you. Yeah, tower, air traffic control, whatever. And so, you know, you kind of know what's coming up and what they're likely to say and how they'll say it and what you'll say back. And it's not really overly complicated. And, um, we were doing some instrument training. I was flying to Austin and it was a cloudy day. So the instructor was with me and she's, she's like, yeah, you're doing great. Everything's good. And then they, the air traffic control like rattled off this huge long clearance of like the approach that we were cleared for. And I went, uh, yeah, I don't know what to say next. <laughs> cause, cause usually it's like clear to land and you're like, cool, I'm clear to land. This was four miles from this, do this, then do that. Then don't forget to do that. Do this, 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 and then you're clear to land. And I'm like, ah, I didn't write any of that down. Um, I just wanted to like press the button and say, okay. (laughs) Gotcha. (laughs) Sure thing there, buddy. (laughs) Don't hit anything. Understood. (laughs) 